We're thankful most of all for the Lord Jesus. We're thankful that he came into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. So we are thankful this evening that he went to the cross of Calvary and there he shed his precious blood. He gave his life that we might have life eternal. We understand that thy word describes us as sinners, lost and guilty, but the Lord Jesus came for men and women, for boys and girls that are found in this condition even tonight. And so we do pray that as the gospel is proclaimed this evening in this place, that the word of God might be a blessing to each one gathered here, especially for those that are still in their sins, those that are on the broad road in danger of losing their soul. So we do pray that the Spirit of God might strive with those that are not saved and that they might understand not only the urgency of the matter, but that they might have a desire to know peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ this very evening. We look to thee expectantly, asking thy blessing and thy help in the worthy name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now turn with me please to Hebrews chapter number 2. The book of Hebrews chapter 2. We're very thankful that you're with us this evening to hear the message of the gospel. Some have been here since early this morning, and we know that you're getting a bit on the weary side. We know that because we are too. So we are thankful that you're still with us, and we'll be thankful if you can stay awake for the next 50 minutes or so to hear the most glorious message that this world has ever heard. It is the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's lots of good news perhaps in the world today, lots of bad news as well, but this is the very best news that there possibly could be. So we're just going to read a few verses at the beginning of the chapter and a couple verses at the end of the chapter. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now come with me to verse number 16. For verily, or truly, he, that's the Lord Jesus, took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And this part that we're going to read now is the part that I really want to take out of this chapter. At this section, it says, To make reconciliation, or propitiation, for the sins of the people. And that's all we're going to read tonight and trust that God will add his blessing to his word. The writer to the Hebrews, and the Bible doesn't tell us really who wrote it. Lots of people have their opinions and that's, that's fine, but the Bible doesn't really tell us who wrote it. But as he takes up his pen and starts chapter number two, he starts with this little word, therefore. And when we come to this little word, therefore, they always taught me when I was younger uh, that if you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is it there for? Well, that's a pretty simple way of looking at it, and, and it's true. So what the writer really wants us to do is to think about what we have read in chapter number one. The problem is that we haven't read anything in chapter number one tonight. Uh, we did hear one verse this morning, uh, but I'm not going to take time to go back to chapter number one except to say this that in chapter number one, the writer has told us all kinds of marvelous things, all kinds of wondrous things about one man that came into this world, about the Lord Jesus. And after telling us how, how great he is, he's going to tell us because of how great this man is, it is necessary for us to be very, very diligent in paying close attention to the message of the gospel. So he's saying that the Lord Jesus is, is greater than the prophets and the Lord Jesus is greater than the angels and because of all of his greatness and because of what he did upon the cross of Calvary, he says, therefore, we have to give, we ought to give 
more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we let them slip. So he's telling us there is a danger, there is a peril, there is, there is a danger of just letting this message slip by. Or if you wish, there's a danger of us slipping by the message. But I think really the idea is there's a danger of letting the message of the gospel slip by. Now, this writer is writing to people that knew the Old Testament. He's writing to the Jewish people, to the Hebrew people, to the Israelites, especially. Now, that really perhaps is not so important for my message tonight. But what I'm saying is this. He's writing to people that are not ignorant of the message of the gospel. They've heard it. He said that. You've heard the message. This message was delivered, first of all, by the Lord Jesus, and then it was confirmed by others that heard him. So he was not writing to people that were ignorant of the message. They knew the message. Now, I don't know everybody that's sitting in the meeting tonight. We're very glad you're here. But I'm sure that there's lots of people, perhaps most of the people here tonight, are not ignorant of the message. They've heard this message before. You perhaps, you perhaps have shared the message with somebody else, even though you're not saved. Even though you don't have peace with God, somebody perhaps at some point in your life has come along and said, well, what, what do they teach or what do they preach where you go to church? And you've been able to share with them something about the message of the gospel, but yet it hasn't changed your own life. So what he's saying is this, you, you know the message, but the danger is that you're just going to let it slip by. And so here we are tonight, the 29th of December, 2018. And perhaps you thought at the beginning of 2018 or the end of 2017, the thought crossed your mind, you know what, in 2018, I'm really going to get this matter settled. In 2018, I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. In 2018, I'm going to be saved. And here we are, December the 29th, quarter to 7 p.m., and the year is slipping away. It's almost slipped away. And your opportunity is slipping away as well. This morning, for those that perhaps were not here to hear what my brother John uh, shared with us about an accident, it appears in the state of Texas, if I understand correctly, where some believers were traveling down to Laredo, Texas to deliver texts, and Mr. Dustin Hayes had an accident, and his 11-year-old son, Hudson, was taken from this world into eternity. 11 years old. Now, I, I'm very, very certain that Dustin and his wife, Crystal, had no idea at the beginning of 2018 that they would end the year this way. And I'm pretty certain that this little boy, Hudson, had no idea at the beginning of 2018 that he wouldn't see the end of the year. I, I doubt very much that he thought he would not see his 12th birthday. But Dustin's son, Hudson, earlier this year, came to know the Lord Jesus as his Savior. So when Hudson was in that horrific accident, Hudson went to heaven. It's better for him. Sad for the family. And that's, why, that's why this message that we're preaching is so urgent, so important. There are other reasons as well. But you and I have no idea what is going to happen before the end of the year. We really have no idea what's going to happen before the end of the day. And as a person is driving down the highway, they have no idea whether they're in a safe place or not in a safe place. So the writer is saying, therefore, because, because this message of the gospel has to do with the person of the Lord Jesus and, and all of his greatness but also because of the fact that our life is really just hanging by a thread. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that, that God has our breath in his hand. And, it, and at a predetermined moment that you and I don't know, but he does know, in a predetermined moment, he will shut his hand on our breath and our life will come to an end. And the big question is, the important question is, where will your soul go. We know, we know most likely where your body will go. Now, I know cremation is a very popular thing today, but putting that aside, our bodies will go to the grave. But the question is, where, where will our soul go? 
And most of us sitting here tonight in this gospel meeting are completely sure, we're completely certain that if something happened to us, like that which happened to Hudson or something else, that our soul would go to heaven. We have peace with God. We have salvation. And so he says we ought to give them more earnestly. This is not a game. This is something serious. And, and I, I know from personal experience that when I was 11 years old, I understood the gospel. I was brought up in a Christian home. I understood that, that I had to be saved sometime, but it wasn't really the most urgent thing in my life. I wasn't giving the more earnest heed. Now, somebody here tonight perhaps will say, what does it mean to give more earnest heed? It's basic, he's basically saying this. This has to be an urgent matter in your life. He's saying you have to pay close attention to this. This is not something that, that is just a, a passing thought. This is not something that has to do with your future here only on earth, but this has to do with your eternal destiny. So he says, therefore, we ought, and that little word ought means we have to give more earnest heed, be more diligent, understand how important this actually is to the things which we have heard. So again, I say, I think I'm speaking to people tonight that know the message of the gospel, and we have to give them more earnest heed, more diligence, more, more attention paid to this message of the gospel, lest at any time, he says, we should let these things slip by us. Perhaps you're thinking, at some point I'm going to grasp salvation. Well, tonight is the night. Today is the opportunity. I don't know about tomorrow, and I don't know about next Sunday, but I do know that now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Because the next thing, beyond the, beyond the diligence that he recommends in verse number one, he's going to say to us in verse number two, uh, talk to us about sin. And he's talking about transgressions, and he's talking about disobedience. So just think about the little word disobedience for a moment, because the word transgression perhaps is a bit more complicated. Not, not that terribly complicated, a bit more complicated. But the word disobedience, I think, that we understand. Right from the very front row to the very back row, uh, I think that any of us who are or were children understand what it means to disobey our parents. It happened in my life that I disobeyed my parents. When I disobeyed my parents, there was a consequence for disobeying my parents. Well, it's not so much talking here about disobeying my parents, although that is perhaps included, but he's talking about the fact that God has given a law and God is holy and just, and his law is holy and just and good, and, and we cannot just do whatever we want in this world and think that nothing is going to happen. We cannot just live all of our life and think that, well, at the, end of, at the end of our life, it doesn't really matter what I did. It doesn't really matter what I didn't do. No, God says that it does matter what we do, and it does matter what we don't do. And when we disobey God's law, we're transgressing God's law, and one day there will be a just punishment for breaking the law of God. And that just punishment in the word of God is called a place of suffering, of sorrow, of separation, a place called hell, a place called the lake of fire. So he is saying this, if the word spoken by angels, the law that was given in the Old Testament, if the law that God gave in the Old Testament was, was steadfast, it was, it was sure. You couldn't just play fast and fancy with the word of God, with the law of God. He says it was something that was steadfast. And he says every, every transgression, every disobedience that, that man committed against God's law, he says it received just recompense of reward. In other words, it received exactly what it deserved. Now, the problem is that in society, many times today, people don't get what they deserve. Now, I'm not thinking so much about the positive side. I know that somebody can work very hard, and perhaps they earn $1,000, and somebody only pays them $800. Well, I, I'm not talking so much about that. I'm talking about the negative side of things. And sadly, in the world in which we live many times, consequences for doing wrong don't come to a person. There's some way that you can get around it, or perhaps in some places offer a little bit of money and get around it that way, or whatever the case might be. But with God, it's not that way. He says, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, every transgression, every disobedience received a just recompense of reward. It received exactly what it deserved, because that's the way our God is. He is a God that gives exactly what is deserved. 
So when we come to the book of Romans, chapter number 6, it says the wages of sin is death. No. Somebody says to me, perhaps, at this point of my message, well, you know what? Um, I, I came here to hear the gospel, and I, I understand that the word gospel means good news, and, and I would say that you're right. The word gospel does mean good news. But at the same time, the Bible is full of warnings. This book is full of warnings. Hebrews is full of warnings. And so as, as the writer warns us about the fact that somebody can just ignore the message of the gospel, it's not that perhaps they are rejecting it entirely. It's not that they're saying, I never want to hear the gospel again. It's not that they're saying the Bible doesn't matter anything to me. It doesn't matter at all to me. They're not saying that. They're just letting it slide by, letting it slip by. And he's giving them a warning. And he's reminding them that in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, under the law, when somebody broke God's law, there was a just recompense of reward. So then he goes on to this question. As we, as we have received something even, even greater, the message of the gospel, he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So the message of, this, of salvation that we are preaching tonight is not just any ordinary salvation. There isn't just any ordinary salvation. It's speaking here about so great salvation because the person who provided this salvation is the one that you can read about in Hebrews chapter number one. He is the son of God. He is greater than the prophets. He is greater than the angels. He has been given a, a name that is higher than the name of the angels and a position, and he has all kinds of possessions. He is a marvelous person, the Lord Jesus. And in verse number three of chapter number one, it speaks about the fact that when he had purified our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And so he has done a marvelous work. He has provided salvation freely for you and for me. So that's why he says here, how do you think that you can neglect this gift of salvation, this offer of salvation, and yet at the same time, neglecting the gift of salvation, escape the punishment of God. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There are some questions in the Bible that the answer is obvious. And the answer here is obvious. There is absolutely no way that somebody can neglect the gift of salvation that Christ has provided, that God offers tonight, and at the end of life say, everything will be well. There's no other salvation. There is no escape if a person neglects this gift of salvation. So when we come to the end of this chapter, where he mentions on several occasions in a certain way the death of the Lord Jesus, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus, I just want to focus for one moment uh, or two in verse number 17. He's speaking about the Lord Jesus, and, and he says that he didn't take on the nature of angels. And it, he took on instead the nature of, of human beings. His interest wasn't so much in angels. Now, there were angels that felt. There were angels that sinned. But he's not going to do something for them. His, his interest has to do with human beings, with you and with me. In all of our need, in all of our sin, in all of our waywardness, in all of our wandering from God, in all of our rebellion, God has looked down upon us and he wants to do something for us. And the only way that that could happen, it says in verse number 17, it behoved him, that means it was absolutely necessary, it behoved him that he would be made like unto his brethren. That the Lord Jesus would come into this world and he would be made like unto his brethren. He would take on the form of a servant. He would be made like unto a man. He was a man. And so men, as they watched the Lord Jesus walk the streets of Nazareth, and many other places as well, they saw a man. It was God. He was God. He is God manifest in the flesh. So when he came into the world, and the world has just celebrated, and you and I perhaps have celebrated as well, but Christmas is the incarnation. Well, that's what he's speaking about here. It behoved him to take upon him to be made like unto his brethren, to take a body. Because it was in that very body that the Lord Jesus would make propitiation for our sins. That's what he says in verse number 17. To make propitiation. Now, I know the word that we have in our King James Bible is reconciliation, but the idea really is propitiation or expiation. 
And you say, well, all those words, whether it's propitiation or expiation or reconciliation, those are, are big words at the end of a long day and they, they kind of are, are complicated and they're, they're going to confuse me. Well, if you just took the time, and we're not going to do it tonight, but if you were to take the time to go back to the book of Leviticus, perhaps your favorite book in the Bible, and read chapter number 16, you find that there is a day of expiation. It's, it's when the people of God... The, the Israelite people were waiting to see what would happen when, when the blood of a sacrifice was taken right into the very holiest place where God himself dwelt. And the high priest would have to go in there. And he had the blood of an animal and he would sprinkle the blood and then he would go back out. And the people understood this. God has looked upon a sacrifice and he's accepted the sacrifice and therefore, we are fine for one more year. So that's basically what was, what was happening. Now, there's a lot more that we could talk about there, but that's basically what was happening. We're, we're fine for another year. So once a year, he entered into the holiest of holies, and he had the blood of an animal. And then he walked back out. But now he's speaking not about a high priest, uh, a descendant of Aaron. He's speaking about the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus came, and he was made like unto us, he took upon himself human flesh, not sinful flesh, but human flesh, and it says it was with this purpose, with this intention, to make propitiation or expiation for the sins of the people. So what happened on the cross of Calvary? The Lord Jesus shed his precious blood. And as it were, he presented that blood to God. Because the Bible tells us, actually it's farther along in this particular book in chapter number 9, where it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, there's no remission of sins. And so he's saying, Christ, as it were, presented his blood to God. And God was completely satisfied with his sacrifice. The, in the Old Testament, they had to repeat the sacrifice over and over and every year, over and over and over again. But when Christ shed his blood, when he gave his life voluntarily on the cross of Calvary, God was completely and forever satisfied. The word that we have here is the same word that we find in Luke's gospel, chapter number 18. In Luke 18, the Lord Jesus tells a, a parable, one of many that he told, about two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a publican, and the other was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the religious folk in town. They were the ones that knew the law, that taught the law. They were respected by the people for the most part. And, and the Pharisee walks up there, and, and he's very proud. He's full of himself, and he starts to talk about all that he has done. And he says, I'm not like this publican. I fast, and I give tithes, and, I, and he's full of I, I, I. And the other man is a publican. He, he is a man that is not respected. He's a man that has perhaps a, a lot of sins. And he walks up and he doesn't even lift his eyes up towards heaven and he smites himself upon the breast, upon his chest, and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now you say, same word? Well, really it's the same word. When he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he was saying, God, you could look upon a sacrifice because in the temple there was a sacrifice. You could look upon a sacrifice and you can forgive me for my sins. You know what? We're saying the same thing tonight. Not a sacrifice in some temple, but the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. That God can look upon the sacrifice of his only beloved son that he did offer voluntarily one time, forever, once forever, and God can be completely satisfied. And many of us, most of us here tonight, what we did, perhaps our words were different, but what we basically did when we came to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, when we were forgiven, we said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm the sinner, but there is a sacrifice, an only sacrifice, the Lord Jesus. And you can look upon him and be satisfied and forgive me for all my sins. We're satisfied. Many of us, most of us here tonight, are completely satisfied with what Christ has done. God is satisfied. And we would like to think that there'd be somebody here tonight that can look upon the person of the Lord Jesus and think about his sufferings upon the cross of Calvary 
and trust him as their savior tonight.